In this teaching module, uh, looking at uh, category incentives matter residuals. So uh, again, there's two types of ways uh, human interaction occur through a voluntary exchange or through the state's coercion on uh, monopoly on coercion. So in voluntary exchange, people are in general uh, exchanging things that they have uh, property rights over. So they, they, they have risk return calculations. They're, they're looking out for their own best interest in exchange with others because they own the residuals to that to those transactions, to those, to that property, to those rights. Uh, if they suffer a loss, they take the loss. If they, if they make a gain, make a profit, they, they keep the profit. So there's residuals uh, through market exchange or voluntary and decentralized exchange. There's residuals. So people then act with a risk versus return calculation and um, uh, they act with nighty and uncertainty. Frank Knight, 1921, uh, Risk, Profit, and Uncertainty. Uh, the future is unknown and unknowable. And so people then, when their own best interest, when they, have, when they own the residuals, then they act in their own best interest. So they, they have better stewardship, stewardship over the, better stewardship and more careful investment when you own the rights to the residuals. So that's the, the uh, Free enterprise is the ability to suffer the loss or, or take a gain through your own entrepreneurship with the results to the residuals. But under, um, and that's the creative destruction of the market is this, the right to private residuals and risk taking. The other, uh, through state redistribution, the politicians and bureaucrats don't own the residuals. They're using other people's money other people's money. And so when you're using other people's money, you're not as careful with the investments. This idea of uh, residuals, this is a, an idea which comes from, from public choice economics. <clears throat> and this is James Buchanan he won the Nobel Prize in 1986 for uh, public choice economics. Um, right, so the idea of Buchanan described, I talked to him about it once and I said, oh, so you're the person who put, uh, it started out as a political economy and then became economic science, right? Predictive science where we used, uh, started out as moral philosophy and then became political economy and then became predictive science. And I, and I asked, I said, so you're the person that put politics back into economics, right? And, and he did. And uh, so he called that, so you're using economic thinking, uh, right? Self-interest, trade-offs, opportunity cost, um, exchange, and applying that to, to, to politics, economic thinking applied to politics, and that's public choice economics. And Buchanan called that politics without romance. And uh, James Buchanan and Gordon Tullock wrote a book called uh, Calculus of Consent in 1962. And that was the big foundational book in uh, public choice economics. And then Right, here's calculus of consent. Let's see, I've, I've got it signed, James Buchanan. Find it. Uh, so I, I talked to him at the Public Choice Center at, at George Mason University. So then if we look, <clears throat> if we look at our categories, Our, our ideal types, uh, Keynes ideal type, where 
national income is equal to uh, consumption, government spending, investment, exports minus imports, and the Hayekian ideal effect where you disaggregate the Keynesian equation and government uh, as a percentage of the economy is a burden. Well, you, you can look at that in terms of residuals and it'll help explain it more because the, the state has no residuals, then they, they, they're not uh, good stewards for, for resources. So they, they tend to be profligate or waste those resources uh, because they're not, because it's Keynesian thinking, it's short-term thinking. Where in the long-term uh, Hayekian thinking or the, the, the uh, entrepreneurial present or uh, entrepreneurial awareness, you're always in the, in the long-term or the immediate term. Uh, you're always thinking about onward investment out into it towards the future, seeking a profit. So you're, you're, you're careful with the resources because you own them. So this can explain why the state is a burden. Uh, but for the, the Keynesians, um, they assume that the state or the government is, a benevolent, is benevolent, meaning they're uh, looking out for the best interest of the collective. But we know from residuals that they're only using other people's money. So there is no incentive to be a good steward of, of society's resources. And this can explain why um, all the debt that's been created because they're, they're, they're spending current resources, not taxing enough, spending much more than they tax, and then passing that debt onto those yet born and yet voting. The reason for that is because there, there is no residuals. They're in office for two, four, six, eight uh, years. Or if you're a congressman, <laughs> congressperson, you have know, 60 years, but you're not, uh, your, your purpose is to get reelected. Re your, your purpose is not to create wealth, but it's to, to get garner votes and work your way up through the party. And there's no uh, residuals involved if you're a politician. You're, current, you're just interested in current votes, not long-term uh, wealth creation. And residuals can help explain that. And <clears throat> residuals can also help explain Sowell's rule. The first law of economics is that resources are scarce. And the first law of politics is to ignore the first law of economics. You're uh, passing on debt to those yet born, and then you're using monetary policy and fiscal policy in your Keynesian economics to steer the economy in the short term. So you're only worried about short term stability and job creation. You're not concerned with long term creative destruction and wealth creation. You are as you are when you have the residuals. And so when you assume that the government is benevolent, you're, you're assuming then that certain experts have superior knowledge and uh, know best how to place onward society's resources. Hayek calls that the fatal conceit because it's impossible to have more knowledge than individuals about what's best for those individuals, especially because those individuals have residuals over their uh, actions. Another good example of the residuals problem <clears throat> is when you look at public investment, and I use that in quotes, scare quotes, because, because politicians and bureaucrats and technocrats don't have the residuals, then it's not really investment. Also it is, 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 is political transfers, uh, what, what Randolph Holcomb calls political capitalism. Uh, job create the fallacy of job creation and the, and the corporate cronyism around that and then so you, you can look at some specific uh examples in history of public investments gone bad uh the solyndra case uh, where we just threw uh billions of taxpayer funds and guaranteed loans at a, at a green energy firm that just wasted the resources. There was an engineer who was interviewed in the New York Times. He said, we just had so much money, we didn't know what to do with it all. So they, they, they uh, just wasted it. Another example is the Buffalo Billion Project of the current governor of New York just wasted uh, 
for every dollar spent in public investment for uh, giving subsidies, it only returned uh, 50 cents or something like that. So it was just a big waste. You didn't have this Keynesian multiplier that uh, you assume under the benevolent government because there's no residuals, but the investment wasn't made wisely. Other examples would include the public health systems. New York City is an, an example. New York City, uh, you know, get a voucher, wait in line, and then you, you run out of the vaccine, assuming that's a good thing. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, you see, and when you have these public investments, public run corporations, it, it creates fraud uh, because, and abuse because there is no residuals involved with the people who are uh, managing it and directing the firms. For example, uh, the MTA, the famous Long Island Railroad, there's a big scam going on right now about people uh, getting overtime, half a million dollars. Two people were made a half a million dollars each uh, one year, uh, I think 2018, uh, by punching the by punching the time clock, and, and then their telephone shows show that they weren't even there on site. So they, they don't have any qualms about taking advantage of people because there is no residuals. It's just oh, it's just the taxpayer, somebody else's money, other people's money. So uh, other examples, of course, are Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. You see a lot of fraud involved in those situations. And there's other examples too of uh, using other people's money and that's called the residuals problem. Uh, examples of the residuals problem, <clears throat> Soul's rule and public resources with other people's money, uh, it skews, skews the power relationship towards the state over private individuals and private firms. And that's because the court system is skewed towards the state. The state has unlimited resources to fight lawsuits. So by definition, it's hard for the individual to fight city hall is the, is the folk wisdom. And <clears throat> so the state always has an advantage in the legal system because of the unlimited resources of the state. Uh, another example, and this is occurring right now, uh, under the COVID period, we've had two stim stimulus packages so far, um, which again go to uh, firms that uh, the state determines essential where smaller firms don't, don't get those resources. And so that, that, that creates what we call corporatism. Where the, the economy and, and, a, and a K type recovery where special firms are bailed out by the state where smaller businesses and that aren't as well connected don't do so well. So special crony, financial crony firms do well during the recovery while everyone else doesn't. And <clears throat> so right now, this third stimulus package does, is not even pretending to uh, go to private businesses. Now it's simply uh, bailing out uh, bankrupt municipalities and states and, and state-owned enterprises. For example, the MTA in New York City, which loses billions of dollars a year is getting a direct bailout from the federal government, well, through the state to the uh, to New Jersey and New York, bailing out the MTA. And same with the public schools. Uh, the public schools are getting billions of dollars under this third stimulus. Again, that has nothing to do with economic growth. Rather, the public schools are run by labor unions. And so the, the these transfers go go to uh, labor union employees through the public school systems. And, and why that's regressive is in general, labor union members make twice as much, the median labor union member makes twice as much as the, as the median general populace. So these, the guise of this third fiscal stimulus, uh, stimulus is really not stimulus at all. It's just bailing out special interest political uh, support. The, the most current election cycle costs $15 billion. And where does that come from? 
or it comes from those who receive uh, prioritized spending uh, from the state through, through other people's money. <laughs> Vote for me and you get other people's money. So the, the solution there is, and you're, you're gonna see this more and more, is, is school choice. When you allow uh, parents and, and children together, families to decide where they go to, to school, what's the best education, well, that puts residuals back into the self-interest, back into the school, into the education system. School choice is a way to, to get away from other people's money, experts, and create residuals. <clears throat> and another big example of the residuals problem is uh, the single payer healthcare. It removes the, the doctor patient relationship and assigns prescribed medical procedures, uh, health coverage to certain special interest groups and uh, destroys the doctor patient relationship. So a third payer or a single payer uh, removes the direct doctor patient relationship. Uh, destroying residuals and self-interest in a, in, a, in a mutual and decentralized exchange. So <clears throat> just like um, one way to uh, add residuals to the equation under uh, schooling is to allow uh, school choice, uh, putting empowerment and uh, decision-making back in the hands of individuals, increasing the residuals over other people's money. <clears throat> Same thing with the MTA. You can, uh, I call it be wise and privatize. Um, let's see that. So, Libertarian means classical liberal. What, what you can do is you can, uh, the MTA or, or the subway systems in uh, New York City were, were private. Uh, when Queens and Brooklyn and Manhattan were different uh, cities, this, the, the, the subway systems were built privately. And so if they were private at one time, there's no reason why they can't be private now. So when I wrote this a number of years ago, uh, the MTA was about 25 billion in debt. Now uh, it's probably up to 75 billion in debt uh, and getting bailed out by, by, the, by the state. So there's ways to uh, privatize uh, the public provision of, of uh, services. Another point about residuals is Keynesian economists. Uh, many Keynesian economists will balance the budget in their own families, <clears throat> right? Incentives matter, residuals. They'll, they'll only create debt if it will give them something greater onward, risk versus return. But Keynesian economists like to run up debt for fiscal stimulus and they, they have this meme, which is that debt doesn't matter. I call it the debt doesn't matter fallacy because we just owe this debt to ourselves and it's helpful to stimulate the economy in the short term for job creation. But the problem with that, it doesn't allow bankrupt assets to go bankrupt. So you don't get the creative destruction and then you get the knowledge problem and the corporatist problem in determining who gets those bailouts. And the reason that that doesn't, it's a fallacy, we don't just owe the funds to ourselves. Uh, when I did my original research on this a number of years ago, the, the Chinese central bank was buying most of the US government debt. But because we've run up such debt, that the Chinese central bank is no longer buying new issues. So at the time, because <clears throat> the Chinese central bank was buying more of our debt, that in fact, we didn't owe it to ourselves. We owed a lot of it to the Chinese central bank. But now uh, the, the Federal Reserve is buying a lot of the US uh, government debt. And so perhaps we do owe it to ourselves, but that's, that's an aggregation problem because who is ourselves? 
Well, we know that a lot of the debt is being passed on, at least 30% of all spending is being passed on, especially today, more than 30% of spending is being passed on to those aren't even born yet, or certainly not voting. So who is ourselves? And that's the, 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 the aggregation fallacy that we see so much under Keynesian economics. So what's the main point? Be wise and privatize. Try to, try to put residuals back into the equation instead of other people's money. And the main point is that politics is self-interest as is economics and society. So residuals means that the state is using other people's money for paternalistic job creation while everyone else loses. Special interests win. The uh, well-organized few gain at the unorganized many and, and <clears throat> at the expense of the unorganized many. And that's what's known as what is seen and what is not seen. So thank you, that completes our teaching module on incentives matter residuals.